Academy of Sciences. Um, so it's a good thing we are doing this online because uh, I would not be able to make the trip uh, to be with you in person today. So um, I'll start, I'll go ahead and start my, uh, my presentation now, as long as everything, everything seems to be working. Uh, so the title of my talk is Nationalism and Ethnic Conflict. And um, sorry, <laughs> I'm just rearranging my notes and such. Okay. Um, the reason why I look at nationalism is because you can kind of think of the Uyghurs as a separate nation within the Chinese state. And there is this conflict between different ethnicities, the Han Chinese and the Uyghurs. So that's the, basically what I'm looking at today. <laughs> but let's uh, take a step back and kind of get ourselves situated in uh, where we are and who we're talking about. By the way, the, the picture that you see is a picture that I took uh, from my kitchen window in the apartment I was living in while I was doing uh, dissertation field work in the city of Urumqi. And the reason why I include this picture is because is to show you that this was a huge city, um, at least 4 million people in the city. Um, so, you know, at least the same size as Chicago. I think a lot of people have stereotypes about Xinjiang thinking that it's all desert or people are riding around on camels and donkeys or something like that. But I was living in a large metropolitan area, very modern, very cosmopolitan. There were people from all over the world living there. Russians, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Tajiks, Indians, Pakistanis, Afghanis, Mongolians, Chinese, and of course, Americans like me, lots of other people living there, teaching English, including from the Philippines, for example. So it was really a diverse group and um, it was very um, modern global life. So that's one thing just to keep in mind, um, you know, as we move through, this was, Xinjiang is really at the crossroads of all of these different cultures. Um, first, I am going to give some basic introduction about who are the Uyghurs? Um, what is the situation like on the ground? So I was there uh, from 2014 to 2017. Uh, I was there for a total of two point two and a half years. So I, I can't really tell you what it's like right now. Of course, I haven't been back since 2017 uh, for political reasons, of course. The, the government actually kicked out all foreigners from the region in 2018. So it's definitely impossible for me to go back now. But um, and of course, we have some we have some knowledge of what's happening right now based on satellite images and some investigative reporting uh, by the BBC, by Vice. They have done some great job doing some articles about what's happening right now. But what I have to give you today is what it was like while I was there which is very different from what you will see in the news. And that's because I really had a more in-depth look at what life was like on a day-to-day -day basis. And a lot of times you will see in the news that 
the only thing we can really talk about in the news is that there are internment camps happening right now. But there's so much more to the story that doesn't get told. And so I'm going to tell you part of that story today, which is what life was like for Uyghurs um, during that time. And in the end, I um, will talk about maps and why they're important. Um, and that's because I come from a background in geography. So I'm basically the culmination of the presentation will discuss how and why. So at the beginning, I told you about the title of the presentation, Nationalism and Ethnic Conflict. Within this context of where we see Chinese people and Uyghur people, kind of in conflict with one another. Um, what role do, does maps play in the story and what role does space play in the story? So I will bring a geographical perspective to the situation. These are some of the headlines that you might have seen in the news recently about the Uyghurs. There are still countless stories coming out every day about the Uyghurs. Um, currently, right now, we're getting a lot of stories from people who were released from the camps. Uh, there was a recent story in the New Yorker that was really good about some eyewitness accounts from what it's like to be in the camps. But these are, this is kind of the, these are some of the headlines you might have seen in the news over the past couple of years. So we know that this is happening mostly from satellite images, eyewitness accounts, and government documents, either data leaks from inside the Chinese government, documents that have been leaked to the press, um, or um, uh, public policy documents that Chinese government has um, publicly come out and said that they have re-education re camps there, as well as other things like advertisements for police officers, advertisements for contractors to build prisons, advertisements for the security guards for the prisons. So based on all of this evidence, we can kind of get an idea of the scale of the internment camps, which we estimate to be around 1 million people. So where, where did the story begin? I mean, how did we get to this point where we're seeing over 1 million Uyghurs detained in internment camps? Well, the story kind of begins in 2009. And this was a really interesting year for me because this was the first year, the first time I went to China. I was a 20 year old at the time and I was, you know, pretty naive, pretty innocent. Um, I was going to China for the first time. I had never heard of Xinjiang. I didn't know anything about it. I'd never heard of the Uyghurs before, um, but these were the kind of things I was seeing in the news that summer before I went. And a lot of times in the media, we see headlines like this about China and about Xinjiang. Um, and sometimes when we see articles like this in the media, we think, oh, well, this is the way it is. This is, this place is dangerous. There's a lot of security presence. Um, you know, it's just chaotic. Maybe we get some stereotypes that it's uncivilized or something like that. Um, but basically we just have we just kind of get this idea, this kind of one-sided story. Um, and so this, all I knew was that this was going on. Um, so where was this happening? Um, this is a map of the region. And I, I use this map specifically because it's a map of the Silk Road or both the old Silk Road, which you might've learned about in school. <laughs> which started in Xi'an, China, um, right, right about here, is usually when people 
say it starts. And it's that, you know, that trade route that linked uh, traders from China um, to Europe. Well, currently China is building what's called the New Silk Road, um, which as you can see on this map is a network of gas pipelines and um, other kinds of infrastructure, including railroads. But as you can see, Xinjiang is at the crossroads of this region. And that's one of the reasons why this is happening. Um, we can go into more about the why uh, during the Q&A if you're interested, but um, basically what's happening is China is expanding its economic and political power across the world right now in Africa and in Central Asia, as you can see from this map. So whenever an empire or a country in these days wants to expand, they, um, they need to consolidate their power. And what's happening in Xinjiang is it's been violent, it's been restless. And so China is kind of trying to make sure that there is no internal separatism happening. And this is why you're seeing the protests in Hong Kong as well, because um, China is really trying to consolidate its power within its own borders because an empire can expand beyond its borders if it's still experiencing unrest within its borders. So this is just a little bit of a background on where we're at. Um, I was living in a city here. That's where the city was. The main Uyghur homeland is in this area. So I was speaking with a lot of Uyghur migrants to the city. Um, Urumqi, the capital where I was living is not a traditional Uyghur homeland. Um, Kashgar is here. Kashgar is the capital of the traditional Uyghur homeland. So this would be that region, but I was living up here. So that's just to say, the, the reason I bring that up and tell you about you know where I was living in is to explain that I'm just giving one snapshot, one moment in time from 2014 to 2017, one spe very specific group of people. I'm just providing a snapshot. I'm not providing a representative sample. I'm not trying to speak for all Uyghurs. I'm not trying to say that this was the situation everywhere, but this is just what I personally experienced. So this is a, a street in a room cheat. I like to show this picture because it shows how multinational the city was. You can see there's a Chinese flag in the middle here. Of course, that's gonna show, you know, this was Chinese territory. They used flags and other kinds of Chinese symbolism to indicate, hey, don't forget, you're part of China. Um, but um, it was very close to Russia. So you can see there, they used a lot of Cyrillic on the signs, um, of course, Chinese. And then this is the Uyghur. Uyghur was written in an Arabic alphabet. Um, it's a Turkic language, but um, they use the Arabic letters. Um, so this is a Uyghur restaurant here, but they also consider themselves to be kind of the brothers and sisters of Turkey. So this is a Turkish coffee shop, which you can see also has English on it. Um, this is just to show that it was a very cosmopolitan but multinational place. This was a place where people from all different places and all different backgrounds really came together. Um, and here is a picture of, you know, pretty typical scene in a Uyghur neighborhood. Um, and I use this picture just to give you an idea of what um, Uyghur people looked like. You'll notice that all three of the men in this picture have mustaches. That was one way that the, that the Uyghurs were, um, 
used their body to show a very distinct identity from the Han Chinese people. So, um, you know, Han Chinese people traditionally had a hard time growing facial hair and they don't have bushy beards, but Uyghurs do. And so they often grew facial hair as a way partially to show their distinct identity, partially to show their Muslim identity, and also to show their Turkish identity because having mustaches like that is a very Turkish thing. So they're kind of signaling that they're different they're, and they're proud of their difference when they're using their body to do that. You'll also see that um, the man on the left in the cart has a dopa on. And this is a very traditional Turkish hat. You'll see very similar hats in Uzbekistan. This was also a way of showing his Muslim identity, but also his cultural identity. So we do this um, in with our own um, you know, bodies all the time. Earrings, makeup, hats, even tattoos, piercings. These are all ways that we use our bodies to show or signal a belonging to a certain group. And Uyghurs were no exception to this. You'll also notice that this is a cart of, <laughs> of sheep. So for Uyghurs, it was really important to always eat halal. Uh, so having Uyghur butchers was a very important practice. Um, to slaughter the sheep in a very specific way according to the Quran and to sell that halal meat was very important because they did not eat pork and um, pork is a staple food of the Han Chinese diet. So this was another way that people were kind of separating themselves. You can think of it similarly in terms of um, Jewish people keeping kosher. It's a very important way to um, solidify cultural bonds within your own group and to signal to the rest of the world that you are, um, you're different and you're proud of that. And here's another example, again, um, men with a dopa or um, other kinds of more European style hats, um, playing the drums and playing the trumpet and dancing. I show this example just to show that there were lots of examples, street culture of Uyghurs showing their music, showing their culture and their affiliation with the Turkish identity. This is a picture from a Muslim holiday. Um, in Turkish, it's called Qurban Eid. Um, I forget what it's called in Arabic, but um, it's, it's um, 60 days after the end of Ramadan. And they, um, this is when they celebrate the sacrificing of um, Abraham's son to God. Um, and that story, it, which is in the Bible, is also in the Quran. Um, and I show this um, just to explain a little bit about what kind of research I did. So while I was there, I integrated with the Uyghur community as much as I could. And what that meant is I learned Uyghur. So I did speak Uyghur very proficiently. I hesitate to say fluently. Um, uh, my Chinese is very fluent, but my Uyghur is, I would say, very proficient. <laughs> and I really integrated with them. I celebrated holidays with them went to weddings, parties, just kind of hung out <laughs> and tried to understand, okay, what is it like to be a minority in China today? And what I found was pretty heartbreaking in a lot of ways. One reason was an increasing, as the years went on, starting in 2014, but steadily increasing until 2017, there was an increasing police presence. And this police presence, as you can see, this police station 
you know, was very close to some very important Uyghur, Uyghur artifacts and the Grand Bazaar, a very famous mosque. Um, and it's got the Chinese flag on it. You can see surveillance cameras in the background as well. These police stations literally were built every block. It was, it was basically every 100 to 300 feet, there was a police station. The idea was you should be able to see a police station everywhere you went. It's kind of, it was kind of almost built after the blue light system on some college campuses you might have heard of where anywhere you go, you can have access to a blue light, which you can tap to call the police. But the idea was that anywhere you went, you would have this button, which they gave to everybody that if there was some sort of threat, you could call it and the police would come. So as you can see, there was this idea that Uyghurs were dangerous or something, that these neighborhoods were um, needed to be controlled by the police. The other part of life that was really scary was the bureaucracy. <laughs> and I say scary because this was something that really pervaded everyone's life. And it was so pervasive and so obtrusive. It was, I argue that it was so complicated and so confusing. It was intentionally meant to track Uyghurs and prevent them from coming to the city. What you see on the slide here is my own personal registration form. I just use it as an example because I didn't want to use anybody else's inf private information. But what you see, I put the translations up here. On the left, you see the floating population <laughs> allowance to inhabit notification. This is not a pretty translation, but I translated it pretty literally just to show you how ridiculous it is. First of all, they call migrants a floating population, um, which is true throughout all of China. But these so-called floaters um, have to register with the city in order to be permitted to live there. And so this is one of those forms that we had to fill out um, to get permission to live in the city. And you see I have my name, my gender, uh, maybe you don't see, it's at the very bottom, but my name, it has my gender, my ID number, where I'm from and who I'm living with. You know, if I'm living with roommates or friends or family. And, um, reason why this is important is because these forms were so complicated and we had to fill them out so frequently. It really caused, and I say we because being a foreigner, I was classified as a minority and so I had to follow all the same regulations that the leaders did. It was set up to make it so it was very hard to come to the city. What that means is that Uyghurs were prohibited from accessing the resources of the city, jobs. They did not want Uyghurs to come there, move there, take the jobs. They wanted to save the jobs for the Han Chinese. Um, they were really creating kind of an apartheid situation where they wanted to really contain the Uyghurs, control them in some way. The other reason why this is important is because the Uyghurs that were able to come and did come to the city, um, they gave all of their personal information to the government. Registering like this meant that the government had very clear records of where all of the Uyghur people lived in the city. They were able to track them very, very easily, monitor them, surveil them, and ultimately arrest them if they so chose. The other aspect of the city that I noticed, um, that I observed, were these spaces of 
economic and social networks, specifically in marketplaces. So this picture is a market, uh, a specifically Uyghur market. And um, sorry, I'm just looking at the time. Um, so this is a specifically Uyghur market. And this was Uyghur sellers, Uyghur goods made by Uyghurs and Uyghur consumers, Uyghur buyers there. This was a very important place for Uyghurs to come together as a social and cultural group, not only to make money and support their own businesses, but also as a way to socialize and as a way to buy goods, again, that signified they were Uyghur, such as the hats. Um, but these curtains uh, were one way that they could decorate their home to make them feel like they were in a Uyghur homeland. The, these curtains are very specifically Uyghur. A Han Chinese person would never have a curtain like this in their house because it's colorful and it has a very specific pattern that is Turkish and it might have some Arabian or Persian influences as well, but it was really important for Uyghurs to have to decorate their homes in a really fancy way that reminded them of their homeland. Remember, they're in the north in the city, so they kind of wanted whatever they could to help them feel like they were at home. So this is what the market looked like. So this is the curtain market. And um, you can see on the left here, there's some stairs. So I went up the stairs. I mean, I went to this market all the time. This was one of my field sites, but I went up the stairs and onto the second floor and turned around. And that's how I took this picture. So this is, and as you can see in the top here, you can see there are curtain vendors all around. It was kind of a quadrangle, a quad you could say. There were curtain stalls all around and you can see there are curtains there. But there were also um, a lot of people who came, you can see they're mostly women because you can see they are all wearing a headscarf. There's a, of course, there's a few men you can see. Some of the men also have their heads covered. You can see some of the men are wearing um, either Arabic influenced hats or Muslim hats in some way. I don't see any dopas, but um, all the women, a lot of the women are covering their heads. So again, just like the mustaches, just like the dopas, they are using a headscarf to signify that they are Muslim and that they are Uyghur and they are not Han Chinese. <laughs> so really signifying to themselves and to the rest of the world that they belong to this very specific cultural and ethnic group. This is really important for people, especially people who are marginalized to have um, a signal of pride and connection with other people in their group to signify belonging, um, to show that they are um, part of a specific identity. And you can see here that they also so these women in the middle are sitting on their inventory. They're sitting on bags. They might have brought some chairs with them, but they've got their inventory out. They're selling clothes. This was, and these are unpermitted vendors. So they just come with garbage bags with their clothes in them, set up for the day, and then they can leave at the end of the day. It's not like the official stalls where the curtains are. And they, I argue, being a geographer, and you can disagree with me, but I argue as a geographer that they, by wearing the headscarf and by setting up shop 
in these markets to sell their own goods, they create a type of territory. And when I say territory, I mean a network. It's an economic network. They're selling goods, um, you know, cash is being exchanged. It's a social network. You know, they're coming, socializing, talking with people. It's a cultural network. This is, these are all clothes and goods, um, you know, primarily Muslim uh, audience. And I would argue that it's a political network as well. Yes, it's a small thing when compared to the huge Chinese state towering over them with police stations and these kinds of things, which is terrible, of course. But they did engage in their own agency um, in terms of setting up spaces for themselves and their own people, their own economies. Um, they were not just victims. They took matters into their own hands and they established places like this, territories where they could come and be themselves and be with their own people. Now, that being said, this is the same market a few months later, totally cleared out in preparation for a demolition project. Some of the permitted vendors remain, as you can see in the background, there's some curtain stalls that remain. This is the same market. This is in the fall and this is in the spring of this of that year. Um, it's been totally cleared out. The vendors were, but, but this is the thing. The vendors came back day after day. I mean, they, the vendors were consistently coming back to stake their territory. And the police would come back, clear them out and they would have to leave. But a couple hours later, because I would hang out and, you know, hang out with friends or talk to people, whatever, the vendors would come back, sell their goods. Now, of course, it wasn't crowded like this anymore, but they would come, they would um, sell, they would drape the clothing on their arms or they would stuff it in their clothes, in their jackets, um, just anything, you know, maybe more, instead of selling big goods, they would have USB cords or smaller things, Q-tips, tissues, things like that. Um, you know, and, and when they saw the police coming, they would stuff their inventory in their coats and run away. My point in saying all this is just to say that Uyghurs found ways to go around the rules. Of course, the government kept coming and trying to shut them down, but they kept coming back. And this is an example of a meal that I shared with some Uyghurs uh, that spring, uh, spring of 2017, which is when the internment camps started. This particular family had recently experienced uh, the death of their mother of, um, she was pretty young. Um, she died of cancer. And so they were mourning her loss and they couldn't really even have a proper funeral for her because the state was cracking down so much on any Muslim practice that they couldn't really even have a real Muslim funeral. But they gathered in their home and they wore the black headscarf for mourning in their home. And they still came together and ate Uyghur food, sat on a Uyghur uh, carpet, ate on a Uyghur tablecloth, spoke Uyghur, and they came together as a family and continued to um, persist in their cultural and identity. Um, and all of these people that I came to know um, you know, they, you can see these young women wearing headscarves in the picture as well. That's just one example of the ways people use their body to um, express a certain, I would argue, territory 
that the state can't touch. Even when the state was saying, you can't do this, you can't do that, they were still trying to do whatever they could to say, no, you're not going to take away my cultural identity. Um, you know, and these were some of the people that I met and spent time with uh, while I was there. Um, and, you know, I block out their faces because the Chinese government is actively, you know, engaged in a lot of surveillance technologies that can track that can track people's facial recognition. And I don't know, I don't think it's safe for me to show pictures of people's faces online. <laughs> and I don't have contact with any of those people anymore because they're either in internment camps or they're afraid of being put into an internment camp. So any contact with a foreigner means they're potentially guilty. By the way, this is from a BBC article, um, which is really good if you're interested in, in looking more at some of the satellite images of the camps. And, and the question is here, what's happened to the vanished Uyghurs of Xinjiang? And, and the answer is, I don't really know. Um, I just know what I saw when I was there, which is that Uyghurs are very resilient and I do think that, sorry, I do think that it's important not to always share the story of victimhood, but it's important to show their identity and why that identity is important to them because it showed the ways that they belonged to a particular cultural and social group. And when you take that away from people, you're taking away their place in society. So I think it's an important lesson for all of us to learn, which is about how do we treat minorities and how can we create a society that is inclusive of all people and identities. So this is um, one of the posters that were on the walls or around the neighborhood that I lived in. There was lots of propaganda. And here it's in Uyghur on the top and Chinese on the bottom, but I inserted in my own English translation. So this was the kind of rhetoric that was happening, right? The government was saying we need to severely punish these violent terrorist crimes. So what's the lesson here? Well, the lesson is that when a certain group is put into a stereotype of being labeled as terrorists, of being labeled as even just being labeled as different than the norm or, but especially when they're labeled as dangerous, we need to be really careful um, because things like this start happening where China is actively trying to transform the weaker identity into something that it's not. So we, let's zoom out a little bit. So I zoomed in really close to the micro scale, talking about some of my own personal experiences in the market, but let's zoom out. Let's zoom out again to this map of China. So when we think of China, we think of this map. Um, and this map looks really clean. It looks really neat. It looks really easy. It looks really simple and it's like, yeah, it's China, what's the big deal? 
But when you have maps like this, these maps don't tell the whole story of what's really happening underneath. And maps are always written by a specific author. This specific author was just geology.com, you know, just making a map, you know, totally innocent by standard, right? But all maps are political. And China and the Uyghur people of Xinjiang are a really good example of that. Here is a map by the source Muslims conditions. They draw the map of China very differently. And they say, no, this is Tibet here. This is East Turkestan, which is the name of the Uyghur homeland that some people use. And this is Southern Mongolia. And the author of this map is trying to make a point that you know, when we draw maps, we have to be really careful about who we're including. Because sometimes when you draw a map, not everybody wants to be a part of that territory. And so in response, like we saw with the Uyghurs, they might make their own territories in marketplaces or on their bodies to signify that they are of a different political identity. And in our own country, like in California, um, we have our own issues. And this is a map of all of the indigenous people and indigenous tribes that find their territory in the state of California. So you can see that, you know, we have our own version of Uyghurs here in our own country our own indigenous people who do not necessarily identify as Americans. They might identify as American Indians, they might identify as Native Americans, but maybe they don't even identify with that label. Um, maybe they identify as Mohawk or Cherokee. Um, but, um, you know, these indigenous people, they have their own version of maps as well. So to go back to this story of the beginning, when we see stories like this, we say, oh, these people are dangerous or, oh, it's a really, you know, there's um, a repressed province, you know, is China fraying? Um, and, you know, it's, it's good to be aware of these situations, of course, but it's also good to be critical of some of these stories and say, okay, well, this is what is China fraying? Well, what does that mean? What, what, what is China anyway? Maybe China never was meant to include the Uyghur homeland. What would happen if the Uyghurs declared independence and had their own country called Uyghurstan? What is really happening on the day-to-day -day level. And so today I told you a little bit what is happening on the day-to-day -day level, which is that the Uyghurs are trying to create their own territory there. And they're doing it in really small ways, but um, you know they do try to hold on to their identity because they don't identify as Chinese. And in the end, I mean, the sad part about all of this is that China is censoring these stories one of the lessons that we can take away from this is to listen to the stories of people who are marginalized, of people who are excluded, of people who are subjugated and ask ourselves, how can their stories give us a little bit of insight into our own country, into our own identities, into our own political situations so that we can ultimately create a better world. But as long as those stories are silenced or we're not listening to those stories, it's going to be hard for us to evolve as a human race. Um, so this is just a little plug, but um, this is a campaign that I'm involved in. Um, so you can go to this website. We don't have a lot of time. I want to make sure we get to questions. But if you're interested in how you can help you can go to this website and there's some advocacy 
things you can do and um, some more information. You can learn more about this particular person who's being held in a camp, who was my professor. Um, I'm working with her daughter on this campaign. So you can go there. Here's some further reading. Um, you can take a screenshot of this slide if you're interested in learning more. I really recommend the book uh, on the fifth bullet point, which is called, um, which is by Sean Roberts. It was published this year, last year. The War on the Uyghurs by, in, with Princeton. So I recommend checking that out, but yeah, you can, um, you can also email me um, if you, you know, have any other questions or if you want to get those further reading resources, if you're interested in reading more about this issue. So um, I guess I'm going to stop my share now because we can get into the questions. Great, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, really, really insightful. Uh, so now we move on to the Q&A portion of the program. Please submit your questions via the chat function. You can access the chat function by clicking on the chat box icon, which should be located near your audio and video buttons. And while we wait for those questions to come in, I would like to mention that we've lined up a great set of programs for this spring semester. We will send out our usual program announcements each Thursday, but please also check our website for the latest updates on future online programs. That's www.icfrc.org. Uh, also, we're very grateful to be able to make our online programs free and open to the public, but we rely on support of our members and attendees in order to operate. We would deeply appreciate a free will donation to help us cover our operating expenses, particularly during this period of online only programming. You can find the link to, the, to donate in the chat section. So, all right, um, if, if it's okay, I will uh, read off the questions and uh, allow you to answer, uh, Sarah, so. Uh, okay, will you read them one by one or? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, one by one, right. Okay. Uh, or just uh, uh, to give you a chance to that. You can, al you can also um, moderate yourself if you, would, if you would prefer that. But uh, uh, so the first question came in is what happened to your friends? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, um, especially the more vulnerable people, meaning people who did not have access to money <laughs> or connections in the government or connections with the police uh, are definitely more vulnerable, definitely people who I can't talk to anymore. Um, I do post on my Chinese social media every once in a while, just to let people know that I'm doing okay. And Sometimes people say, you know, well, just give me a like or whatever, but um, a lot of people had to delete me when I left because it was too risky to have a foreign contact on their social media. Great. Are there other minority groups subject to such harsh government policies in China? Yes, there are um, other Muslim minorities in China besides the Uyghurs, including Kazakhs, Uzbeks, Tatars, um, Kyrgyz, Tajiks. So I would say the two that are suffering the most from internment camps are probably Kazakhs and Uyghurs. Um, but the other group that is, has experienced a lot of oppression that you've probably heard of is Tibetans. Yeah. Um, what was the response of your Uyghur friends to the introduction of so many police stations? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> so it was interesting because when they were first starting to be built, um, nobody knew what they were. Like we just saw a bunch of structures and it was in September, October and Xinjiang is really cold. So we thought maybe they were like warming stations for the police to warm up because there were a lot of police on the streets that summer and we thought maybe they would need to warm up <laughs> during patrols or something like that during the winter um, or something like that. Or we thought they were maybe public bathrooms or something like that. Um, 
but then we soon found out that they were actually police stations and we were like oh wow that's really interesting um and I think for a lot of people I mean there's just so many factors that went into that like for example police officers are paid really really well so what that meant and a lot of a lot of Uyghurs are police so what that means is more and more Uyghurs are kind of incentivized to join the police. You'll see this in other colonial regimes as well, you know, such as in Africa, where they do employ local people to act as the police. Um, and so that was a big implication of like, oh, more and more Uyghurs aren't going to go into things like art and culture or literature or these other kinds of jobs, they're gonna to wanna to become police officers instead of you know, contributing to the weaker intellectual sphere. So that was part of it. But yeah, it was definitely pretty scary when we realized that they were police and we were just like, what? But then after like a few more months after that, we just kind of got used to it. And we just used them as public bathrooms because they all had bathrooms in there and we would just like go in there and use the bathroom. So it kind of was this weird feeling of like you kind of get used to it after a while. And that's kind of one of my arguments is that, yeah, like these things are really scary, but you kind of make do with what you can and you create these coping mechanisms through creating your own territories like the headscarf that allow you to kind of survive through the madness. Um, okay, the next uh, question begins with great talk um, and asks, there are Uyghurs who are successful in China. Uh, are they considered traitors to their own people? And, and I assume that means China more broadly. That's a really good question. So, Currently, most Uyghur intellectuals and cult cultural figures have been arrested and detained in internment camps at this time. This includes like huge Uyghur figures um, that before 2017 were considered very famous. So the slide that I showed with the woman with the freemymom.org, she was like really famous in China as being like the top Uyghur anthropologist. She was, she was on the front page of magazines. She was like super famous, especially being a woman. And, but she was detained in 2017. So right now the situation is totally out of control to the point where there aren't really that many, but there are some Uyghurs. Those people were not considered traitors. Those people were the pride and joy of the Uyghur people, you know, very successful professors and musical artists, poets, authors, those kinds of people were definitely like the pride and joy of the Uyghur people. Nowadays, the people who are not interned, who are in positions of power and leadership uh, probably would be considered traitors. I, I can't say for sure, but generally the people who are in like po political power positions of power are considered puppets of the Chinese government. All right, um, uh, we, we have a pair of questions um, that uh, begins, thanks so much for this wonderful presentation, Sarah. Um, and I'm gonna uh, read the second question. Um, uh, I really like your point about recognizing that maps are authored like texts. As a geographer and as someone who utilized qualitative research methods, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about ways positionality might be included into how maps are presented. Nice. I wonder if that's from Elise. <laughs> uh, no, it, it, is, yeah. uh, um, it is from Gordon Louis. Oh, okay. Cool. I just, I saw Elise. I don't know if Elise is still here, but Elise was my colleague at University of Colorado, um, who also is a political scientist working in China. So I thought maybe that was her. <laughs> so the question was about positionality and map authorship. Yes. Okay. Um, hold on, I'm gonna try to see if I can, okay, as a geographer, 
Oh, that's a good point. Okay, so the ways positionality can be included and in how maps are presented would be like saying the title, saying maybe the title is a political map. So for example, a political map of China and then having the author of the map really clear. So, you know, this was map was made by the, um, you know, National Geographic or whatever. Um, but another way to do it is to show certain borders as um, dotted. So in some maps of China, you'll see there are borders around India that are, it's a dotted line to show that those territories are still contested between China and India. You know, some maps will show Taiwan as like, this is a contested territory. Hong Kong is contested territory. South China Sea is contested territory. Just being a little bit more clear of what is, you know, still contested or maybe, you know, having maps if for the United States, it might be something like having maps that say all of this territory is occupied, you know, all of this is indigenous territory occupied by the United States government um, or something like that. But yeah, you'll see in some, like in Australia, they're really clear, like this is occupied territory that belongs to the Aboriginals. So it, it yeah, it, it, it kind of depends on like your context, but those would be some ideas I would have. Okay, another question is um, back to the police stations. Uh, when the Uyghurs realized that the new infrastructures were police stations, what, was there a sense of fear within the community? What was the overall attitude toward the police stations? And was there a sense of understanding about why they, why they were there? Yeah, I think there was a sense of understanding about why they were there. Um, I think mostly it was about, they knew that they were seen as terrorists like they you know that word was used a lot they had to do a lot of paperwork to prove that they weren't terrorists and i think they knew that they were being policed they knew that they were under surveillance and um and that kind of thing um i do think that there was a sense of fear like i think people got really on edge and people were more scared to do things that they weren't supposed to be doing. Um, even if it was like really small things, like growing a beard, you know, for example, was not allowed, you know, people would be scared to do something like that, I think. Um, after a while though, people were just like, this is so stupid. <laughs> and then just, um, use them as public bathrooms because everyone's just like, why, why do we need police stations every block? Um, but yeah, there was an understanding that like they were there to monitor and to control. All right, well, we've reached a time where we need to conclude our program. Uh, I wanna thank you very much uh, for taking us behind the headlines in this way. This has uh, really been great. And I'm honored to uh, virtually present you with the, what we like to call the coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council coffee mug. Uh, and uh, you can use it for coffee, tea, or the beverage of your choice. Uh, and we'll be coordinating some way to get it to you uh, or maybe to your home in the States uh, after the talk. Um, thank Thanks also to everyone in the viewing audience for joining us. Um, uh, Sarah, if you could, uh, one question asked for information about other resources. And since you had those slides uh, at the end of your talk, yeah. maybe you could put that back up as we- uh, Oh yeah, I can put it back up. You know what else I can do? I can put it in the chat. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so with that, uh, uh, thanks again to everyone. Uh, thanks to Dr. Tynan for uh, her insights and we are adjourned. Okay. Oh, it's not working in the chat, but I'll put this slide up. I took a screenshot of it as well. So if anyone wants to email ICFRC, I'd be happy to send them the screenshot. Oh yeah, that would be good. Um, I'll just put it up for a minute here if anyone wants to do a screenshot, but otherwise you can email Megan.